So um, welcome to the Oral Health Podcast. We're doing um, another series for Mouth Cancer Action Month this year. Uh, we've been talking to more mouth cancer survivors with their stories that they're willing to share and also different professionals about all things mouth cancer. So today I'm joined by Karen. She's been on um, many a podcast before, so needs a little introduction. But um, yeah, she's our, our dental expert for the day. So um, yeah, here we are. How are you? I'm good, thank you, Sophie. Are you? Yes, I am. I am. Monday morning's always a bit, ugh, but no, doing well. <laughs> and a cold, a cold, rainy Monday morning as well. It is, which is a shame. But um, yeah, so today we're talking about the um, the state of mouth cancer report that we do every year, um, because there's quite a few different things that have come out of that that um, I think deserve a little bit of discussion. Um, some of it's quite concerning. So um, if we just go down through the main findings and we can chat about about each of them. Um, so new cases of mouth cancer in the UK reached 8,846 last year, and that is 34% more than in the last decade and 103% higher than it was 20 years ago, which is just a... a such a concerning rise that it's going up that steep it's um yeah we were quite shocked to, to see that yeah absolutely and when you look at other cancers oral cancer is taking over um so many of them now and so many people are just not aware of you are able to get cancer in your mouth um mm -hmm. So where the awareness is there on cancers of other parts of the body, you know, bowel cancer, cervical cancer, um, all those kind of, you know, ones that are in the in the news all the time, oral cancer um, is is topping them. Yeah, and it's it's growing at such a a high rate. Um, and I will say this is specifically mouth cancer. The stats must be even higher for the general head and neck cancers like in the in the throat in the voice box um in yeah it's this is specifically cancers in the mouth and of those 58 percent are on the tonsils and the tongue which is more than half um so lip cancers are a little bit less common um tongue cancers is generally the one that we see the most of in our our ambassadors who share their stories most of it is tongue uh tongue related what do you think why do you think that is like why the tongue um it, it's probably down to the type of tissue it is um you know most most oral cancers are squamous cell carcinomas so that is kind of the moist areas um that that kind of um cell makeup uh it seems to be where the most of the cancers are so that would include the insides of the cheeks etc but um yeah the tongue and the tonsils do seem to be the um the the highest rate of of uh, oral cancers mm -hmm. and um so a one positive thing that came out of the 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 survey that we did um across the UK is Nearly nine in 10 people have now heard of mouth cancer, which is much higher awareness than there has been previously, but they don't have any awareness of the signs and symptoms and the risk factors, which to me is quite a strange, a strange statistic of people can go, oh yeah, I've heard of it. Don't know how you get it. It just seems a bit disjointed. Yeah, it does. And, and it's great to know that uh, so many more people are aware of it, but if you don't know the signs and symptoms then you're not in a position to help yourself if you get one of those signs or symptoms mm -hmm. so it's really important that that people not only are aware of the cancer but they know what the causes are and they know how to spot it mm -hmm. because as we we say so many times the earlier we catch it the better result we're going to get so it is really important for people to um just know what what to look out for really yeah and we have um lots of videos and things online about how to check yourself and um how what you're feeling for and we've got more resources coming out through the campaign uh, on that topic but what are then some of the big signs and symptoms so off the top of my head 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm testing myself now. Um, so red and white patches and ulcers and hoarse voice are the ones that off the top of my head I can remember being so early on a Monday morning. But what are the uh, what are the other ones? Because I know there is some. Well, it's important to remember that it's um, uh, three weeks. We're looking at, at having an ulcer or a red and white patch or a hoarseness of the voice for longer than three weeks that there isn't a cause for. I mean, obviously, ulcers are generally a traumatic ulcer. So you've you've caught yourself with your toothbrush or had a sharp piece of food. But if it is a traumatic ulcer, that will go within three weeks. So if you get one that is staying longer for that, from longer than the three weeks, then you really need to get that checked out. So re realistically, we're looking for any changes in the mouth. So anything that's different for, for you. So obviously the red and white patches, the ulcers, the horses of the voice. But we're looking to see for any lumps or any um, asymmetrical looking look at your face. So if you look in the mirror and you see one face, one side of your face is different to the other, then that needs checking out as well. So, mm -hmm. and sticking your tongue out, if you can't stick your tongue out straight, again, that would be another um, another warning sign to just go and get things checked with your dentist. Yeah, and like you say, everything's so relative to you. Like, you know your mouth better than anyone. If you think, oh, it's not, it doesn't feel quite right, even if it doesn't look any different, if it doesn't feel different, then surely that's a sign to to go and speak to someone about it definitely and you know we are um you know we're told so often to check parts of our bodies for lumps bumps any changes that should be for the mouth as well so while you're you're you know looking for lumps in the breast or the testicles or you know all of these places that we are uh, advised to do it is important to do the mouth as well. So you're looking and feeling for anything um, that is different from the time before almost. Mm -hmm. And um, something else I think would be key to pick up on through this report is that more people are dying from mouth cancer than there ever has been. Um, so last year, the total was 3,034 people, which is already about 10% higher than it was just the year before. Um, if I had, I did have a quick look at the statistics just to double check that that was correct. And the amount of people that passed away from mouth cancer was 2,702 the year before. So that's already jumped up just 10%. Uh, so 10% in just 12 months, which is astonishing if that was any other cancer that would be an area of real real concern but because mouth cancer is not that well known about it it seems to just do you know what i'm trying to say like it's mm -hmm. it's really surprising it's to a me. real shocking it's a real shocking figure and and the majority of oral cancers are not um not not investigated until they're in stage four which by then you've got quite a large um, area. So, um, you know, stage four in any other cancer is, well, the same with oral cancer, you're getting to a very serious point. So it's it's really important to get on top of this and, and look for the earlier signs rather than, you know, rocking up to your dentist when it is at stage four. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. That with any cancer, really, the 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 chances of better outcomes from the treatment are much higher the earlier it's detected, and that just goes for any any cancer. But especially with the mouth, like because I've I've spoken to you know some of the different survivors that you know we'll hear from later in the month that the side effects of what's happened, and they've had to have bits of tongue removed and different surgeries, and it's all very intense treatment and that only gets worse the longer you leave it but that's not to scare people into thinking oh no but um it's something to touch on that the earlier it's caught the better outcome you've got yeah the better physical outcomes you have the, the sooner it's caught because there is less of you know for example um if the tumor is in the tongue you lose less of the tongue which means you keep more of your speech mm -hmm. um and you know the the earlier everything is caught 
it just makes life the quality of life better for the patient Mm -hmm. and speech and language therapists do some incredible work with head and neck cancer patients and um that yeah there's a lot that can be done but um circle back to the original sort of point of the earlier it's caught the better the chances are um which is why we champion dental visits so much well one of the reasons because they are trained to check for mouth cancer and they can often detect it much earlier than you might even think that there is anything there absolutely and and you know it it is a two-pronged thing you know we're looking for the patients to look for anything different in their mouth but if you're attending a dentist regularly the dentist will be looking as well so the dentist will check you every six months and you're checking on every month in between that so if you find something in between you don't need to make wait for your six monthly 12 monthly checkup whatever recall you're on get yourself back to the dentist um they prefer to have a look at you know 20 different marks in somebody you know in, in people's mouths just to pick up one that may be suspicious and um and refer on mm-hmm. yeah that they I think after every dentist I've spoke to, every professional I've spoke to, they'd rather catch something one in 20 patients than have someone not go because they're worried that, oh, well, it's fine. There's, 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 there must be nothing. Use some sort of gel to soothe it or um, or I'll get something from the pharmacy. It'll be all right. And then the longer it's put off, like, it's always best to go. Yeah, I think it's part of our nature, isn't it? We don't want to be a burden on people. And we all know that the NHS is sort of is overstretched, etc. So we are very tempted to say, oh, I'll leave it. It'll be OK. And I'll, oh, I'll, I've got a visit in a couple of months time. That'll be fine. But um, like we say, this this is what dental professionals want to see you for one of the reasons they want to see you uh, regularly for so it is you're not wasting anybody's time they would rather as we've said before sign you off with a clean bill of health or refer you on um if necessary Mm -hmm. now um those are some of the statistics that have come out of the the mouth cancer report which if anyone's interested can go and read in the entirety um because we can't mention everything in there on here because it will be like a five hour (laughs) discussion (laughs) but um some of the things that we are calling for from that is more funding for nhs dentistry investment in education uh, so more people can be aware of the different signs and symptoms and also more uptakes for things like the hpv vaccination because hpv is fast becoming one of the most common causes of mouth cancer um now, NHS dentistry is such a hot button topic. We won't go into it too much, but we are all on the same page at the foundation that more money needs to be put into it so that people can be healthier. That's that's really the crux of it. Um, but in terms of education and vaccination, what what can we sort of say to that? Well, it's a, yeah. We've had quite a lot of, um, obviously, over the last couple of years with various lockdowns, because the vaccines are given in schools and schools haven't been in, there's been a lot of children um, that um, have sort of fallen through the cracks, basically. Um, So obviously they need to be caught up with, with the next cohort coming in to have their vaccinations. But interestingly enough, I was talking to um, some of my mum friends and... Um, about this subject of the lower um, uptake of the HPV vaccination and one of them interestingly said are we not jab fatigued so we're having so many injections at the moment you know with the COVID and flu etc that the possibly is a you know I've had so many injections I really don't want another one or I don't want my child to have another injection so that might be part of it as well because um you know when when they have it at school I know you have to sign a form but you kind of do it and you just go oh yeah they need to have that um so maybe the group that missed it during the lockdown maybe the parents are having a bit more of a think maybe I don't know it was just something that somebody said to me that I hadn't Mm -hmm. hadn't occurred to me that we might be fed up of people sticking needles in us. Yeah, it's a good point. And especially younger children, like that's any parent's going to 
want to consider anything that they give their children that goes without saying and yeah mm-hmm. if they're or having COVID vaccines flu vaccines it, yeah it's it's an extra two jabs that you might want to spare them if you don't think it's necessary I guess mm, yeah and I think you know the education and all the work that that um we've done to get uh HP the uh jabs for boys it would be such a shame if um you know we had you know almost a couple of school years that haven't had that injection so they don't have the protection Mm -hmm. and when you look at not just the hpv from an oral cancer point of view but from you know the original use of cervical cancer i mean that that has dropped 90 percent so it's so i mean it's so good that we we're getting in there and helping to protect our younger people so we've got to have the education out there that this is a a vital um vaccination for the future health of those children you know for the rest of their lives they are protected so it is really important you know having that conversation with your children when they're in that um the the years that are uh, the vaccination is open to certainly it is probably easier to speak to a girl to say why you're having it because you probably you know are thinking more from the cervical cancer um route but i i know with with my children when they were of that age um my son missed out the um jabs for boys uh so Mm -hmm. he hasn't been vaccinated but my daughter has and i have discussed with them you know the need for it and why it's not just people with a cervix that need the uh, the vaccination so it is it isn't an easy conversation to have with young people the reason why they need to have the um the hpv vaccination but i think it's important that that we do and if i was a parent of a child that had missed out on the hpv vaccine due to lockdowns i would be asking you know my gp to give it um because there are ways to still get it even if they missed the sort of in school vaccination program mm-hmm. that's an important point to to pick up as well like you can go to the doctor or um i'm not 100 percent on what different schools are doing to try and catch up um they'll have now two or three years worth of children they need to vaccinate rather than just yeah. one um and i'm sure they're all doing their own things to to make sure yeah, they catch sure. everyone but yeah there's nothing stopping you talking to a gp or um a school nurse or someone about how to to make and sure also, your child gets it um if your daughter your daughter can have the um hpv vaccination up to the age of 25 on the nhs so if you've got a child that missed out uh, for whatever reason, um, you know, when it went through the schools, they can still get it on the NHS if they're under the age of 25. But yeah, that on that point, because there is not very much awareness of HPV, the awareness of major risk factors for mouth cancer is as low as 9%. And HPV, I think, would make up quite a large number of that. I don't think people associate HPV with mouth cancer. I could be wrong, but that's just the impression I've got from talking to people. Yeah. I don't think so. And and when because we can um, differentiate, we can see w- what number of the HPV virus has caused the oral cancer. And it's HPV 16 and HPV 18, which predominantly cause um, oral cancers, which are obviously linked to HPV positive um in the cervix so that's we, we can actually link it we can say to patients you have caught this via the hpv virus yeah and they tend to be further back in the mouth as well hpv um cancers yeah yeah um which when we talk to our different guests we've got coming on we'll we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail because it's really interesting um, you know, someone that like myself is not a dentist or a dental professional is very interesting to learn about from their perspective. But um, I was going somewhere with that. And now I don't know what it was. No, I do. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> the the big 
risk factors I think people think of is smoking. Yes. Not necessarily maybe drinking or bad diets, UV exposures, um, certain genetic conditions can put you at a higher risk. Um, fam family, can I speak today? Like family history, that's also a big one. Um, you know, if you've had a close relative that has had mouth cancer, you may be at higher risk. The same as with breast cancer. Um, but yeah, the I think the only one people really associate coming from a non-dentist perspective is smoking. That's kind of a, oh, well, yeah, smoking and cancer, yeah, they're linked. It's going in yes, the mouth. Yes, I think everybody, uh, everybody uh, knows that smoking causes cancer. It causes lung cancer. I'm not entirely sure that they are completely uh on board with it it causes mouth cancer as well i think they know that it causes cancer somewhere but i don't think the first uh first place they would think of would be the mouth they would immediately think of the lungs mm. but you know as i say to people if you are smoking it's going from your mouth all the way down into your lungs so the potential is to get cancer in any of those places that you know the the uh the tar and the nicotine has has been passed so it's uh it's anywhere really right up to the lungs mm -hmm. but obviously looking at at smoking um and drinking alcohol you are almost doubling your risk if you do both yeah so because people tend to um drink smoke more when they're drinking and and social smokers etc that kind of thing you are putting yourself more at risk by doing both so it's uh one or the other or none <laughs> would be best none would be best yeah but we're humans we know that we can't say to people never smoke never drink because people can do it you can do what you want with your life really can't you Absolutely. it's just yes. if you're going to do it be aware that you've got a risk yeah. to it yeah and I think that's that's what it is. It's saying, I mean, we do all do things that are perhaps more risky than we, we probably should. And, you know, some days you can have three cups of coffee a day and then a week later you can only have one cup of coffee. Because, you know, new reports are coming out all the time. So, um, you know, we red wine is good for us. Dentally, red wine stains your teeth, but you know, it, it's like looking at everything. And you know, we can't live in a little sterile box where we don't have any risks at all, but it's knowing your risks and trying to, um, not and reduce those risks so that you are aware of, uh, you know, you're aware of what you're doing, and there'll still be people who, who want to, but as long as we've uh we've tried you know we've tried to educate people you take it or leave it don't you like with everything really yeah yeah and people are always gonna do whatever they want to if someone smokes they, they know it's written all over cigarette packets the dangers that it can cause they're aware they still do it that's fine just if you're gonna smoke you need to be aware to maybe check yourself more regularly for mouth cancer yeah. I would yeah. say that you need to, you would be needing to visit your dentist certainly every six months. But, you know, we have to remember that these things are addictive and it's OK for us to say, stop doing it, cut down. It's not that easy. You know, when you are, um, you, you know, it's like any addiction, you, you might need help with it, which obviously you can get from the doctors or a smoking cessation um, courses that you can go on to. But uh, I do totally understand that us sitting here in our ivory tower saying give up smoking, give up drinking, it's not as simple as just saying that. But we just want people to be aware of this could be a consequence of your actions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it may be the reason that you do want to give up. It might be that little bit of extra that you need to uh, sort of push you to get some help with it. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm just looking over our little list to see if there's something that we haven't mentioned. I think we've covered all the main things that we've put out in our report. Um, you know, the cases are rising, um, which is a phrase I think we are all fatigued of. 
But, um, you know, it's mouth cancer is becoming much more common than it has been. But also people are being a little bit more aware of their mouths now than they ever were. So there is good and bad that has come from this. But the big thing that has come out of our research and our talking to people and is that we all need to a check ourselves for mouth cancer that's especially true if you know that you're at a higher risk but also we need to be aware of things that we do that can put us at a higher risk even small things like wear an spf lip balm when you go outside because Mm. uv rays put you at a higher risk and i think the gap is closing a little bit because it was predominantly a male um cancer but i think that the the gap now is is shrinking between males and females but obviously the the highest risk is being a male over 40 that smokes and drinks i mean that is you've got sort of like a triple whammy there so it's those um those people that we just would like to raise awareness and you know talking talking to your friends and your family i mean i i find now that if i speak to somebody about oral cancer the majority of people i know know somebody who has had it, which when I first started in dentistry, we didn't talk about it at all. And I would have been very surprised if any anybody I knew um, knew anybody who had um, either is a, an oral cancer survivor or unfortunately um, lost their lives due to it. But these days I find when I talk to people, um, more more often than not that they do know somebody which um is is a good conversation starter and um you know when you when you're talking to people about all sorts of things you can um just see if they're doing you know doing checks or if they've mentioned anything to their dentist because you can always say to your dentist your dentist will automatically be doing an oral cancer check, but they may not mention it to you that they're doing it. But there's nothing to stop you saying to your dentist, have you done my oral cancer check? And uh, are you happy with everything? So that you can feel reassured that your um, your dental professional has, um, has checked you and can't see anything um, that they would feel suspicious about. You've summed that up very well. Uh, I don't have anything extra to add to that, Um, (laughs) as always, Karen. But um, (laughs) if you want to learn more about the State of Mouth Cancer report that we've done, you can go online and read it. It's on our website, mouthcancer.org. You can also find us on Twitter, mouthcancer.org. Facebook is the same. Um, Instagram, we're at Oral Health Foundation. Um, But throughout the month of November, we're going to be sharing lots and lots and lots of um, videos, information, um, podcasts with different professionals like Karen here. Um, And just helping people be a bit more aware of their mouths and um yeah so i feel free to have a look at all of those and we will see you next time 